Welcome to Highbrow Lowbrow, the show where our podcast hosts Steve Powell and Dan Slattery pit high art against low culture. In this episode, we celebrate the work of British director Stephen Frears and look at two seminal films of Frears' career. Steve discusses the gangster road movie The Hit and argues it will take you on a journey towards cinematic heaven. Dan argues that the music, romance and listing obsessed movie High Fidelity should make it into your top five rom-coms of all time. Have we argued our case successfully? As always, dear listener, the final decision is up to you. Spoilers ahead. Enjoy the show. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this latest episode of Highbrow Lowbrow. And we have a very special episode for you tonight because this is an episode that celebrates the diverse career of Stephen Frears, who has made many, many films from gangster films to thrillers to comedies to dramas, political dramas, even royal dramas uh, and human dramas. And we have two very interesting choices. I will start with my highbrow Stephen Frears choice, which is the 1984 gangster road movie, The Hit. I'll begin with the plot. Okay, in The Hit, Terence Stamp plays an East End villain called Willie Parker. And he has turned supergrass, which is British slang for an informer. He was the getaway driver for a London mob. The opening scene with him is in a kind of rundown flat being guarded by uh, Scotland Yard detectives uh, who then ferret him away to the Old Bailey where he testifies against uh, four of his ex-colleagues in crime. As he's walking out the courtroom, the gangsters who are going to get sent down because of his testimony get on their feet and start singing, we'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. And obviously this is uh, the old Vera Lynn tune from wartime, but it's a threat to him saying, you're walking out now, but we'll be back to get you. The one gangster who doesn't stand up and sing because he doesn't need to, he's the boss. You know, he keeps his temper in check because he doesn't need to commit violence himself is Mr. Corrigan. He's the head of the mob and he's being sent down and he's wearing sunglasses. He looks very menacing. It's his only scene, but he was played by Lenny Peters, who was a blind pop star, and one half the pop duo Peters and Lee, and he was also the uncle of Charlie Watts, the Rolling Stones drummer. So a little bit of trivia there. Anyway, back to the plot. So we jump to 10 years later, uh, Stamp, uh, Willie Parker, is now living in Spain. He seems like he's got an ideal life, he's got his own hacienda, he speaks fluent Spanish, he's strolling through the town, having a lovely day, and then he gets back to his home, and he's snatched by a gang of Spanish youths and they throw him into a car and they run over his Spanish protection officer on the way who's, who's either killed or seriously wounded. And then they take him to another car where he is met by two hitmen. Braddock, played by this icy cool uh, John Hurt, uh, a hitman who is, it's, it's all about the job for him. He's just a professional killer. He's got no emotions. And in fact, there's references that He's killed so many people and he's changed his name so many times that even he's a bit confused as to who he actually is. It's never revealed what his real name is. And then a much younger hitman called Myron, played by a a then only, in his early 20s, Tim Roth. And Myron is more of a yobbo hooligan type, hot tempered, you know, trigger finger. And they nicely contrast each other. They're the pair of bickering hitmen. And you think that this is probably a big influence on Quentin Tarantino, who, you know, specialised in kind of bickering hitmen in films like Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs. But we know these guys are dangerous because the minute they've got stamped, the first thing they do is the supposed payoff they're supposed to give to the Spanish gang turns out to be a bomb, so they blow up the Spanish gang. So these guys are dangerous. And their plan is that actually to drive Terence Stamp to Paris, where Mr. Corrigan is waiting and he's going to be executed either by Corrigan or in front of Corrigan. So it looks like Stamp is done for. But then things start to go wrong. They find out because the policeman was wounded, the Spanish Garda is after them. And there's this dogged Spanish detective after them. And he's played by the great Spanish actor, Fernando Rey, who you may recognize from films such as uh, The French Connection and The Discreet Charm and The Bourgeoisie. He's one of the big Spanish stars. So they've got the Spanish Guard on their tail. They take a detour to Madrid, where John Hurt 
knows a place where he can pick up a car, but when he gets there to this apartment, he finds that there's a gate crusher, it's an Australian crook, who he knows from a past life, and the crook's very, very young Spanish girlfriend, Maggie, played by Laura Del Sol, who's this beautiful flamenco dancer and actress, and this was her first role. So they decide to take Maggie as a hostage, and this causes a rift between Roth and John Hurt, because John Hurt's under no illusions, like, She's seen them both, she can identify them both, so eventually they're going to have to kill her. And Tim Ross starts to go a bit soft. He doesn't like the idea of killing a woman. I guess there is honour among thieves. And on top of all this, they, they expect Stam to be terrified, and he's not. He's got this kind of Zen-like Buddhist calm about him. He seems like completely at peace with his impending death. He doesn't seem to have any fear or any bitterness but he is quite cleverly playing the two men off against each other. He knows exactly what buttons to push mentally. And you think that if he drives them up the wall so much, he might actually get away. So the tension begins to ramp up. Now, that's about all I'll say about the plot. Thematically, the hit is a gangster film. There's no doubt about that. It's also been described as a, as a Western because they're traveling through the frontier, really, it's the Spanish frontier. There's references to the amount of armies that have passed through Spain, you know, from the Crusaders, the Saracens, to, to Napoleon's army, to Franco's army, you know. So this was a place of many battles over the centuries. And the views of the Spanish landscapes are just stunning. You see the, I'm going to struggle with my pronunciation here, but the windmills are consigra, which made famous from the Don Quixote story, and stunning waterfalls in the Aragon region, and many others. So this is also a road movie. Almost the entire film is set on the road. But it's also an unusual road movie because even though you have these very dangerous hitmen, right away the plans start to go awry and they've got to keep changing directions. They're supposed to go to Paris, but they decide to go to Madrid and then they seem to drive around the countryside on end and Tim Roth's shenanigans, you know, his kind of immature hooligan shenanigans keep getting him in trouble and the the guard are after them, so they have to keep changing directions. It gets to the point where even they're not sure where they're going. A few production notes for you. It is a wonderful soundtrack. The opening bars is an electronic riff by Eric Clapton and Roger Waters. And then the rest of the soundtrack is traditional Spanish music by Paco de Lucia. Now, Willie Parker, the Terence Stamp character, was based on Bertie Smalls. And Bertie Smalls was a crook in the Wembley mob. And he was one of the first big time informers and he started the supergrass phase because to grass is to snitch on your pals. But the supergrasses were very high ranking organized crime figures when they came into their own. When they started cutting deals with the Crown Prosecution Service in the 1970s, their testimony was so damaging, it practically destroyed the traditional London organized crime firms. Also, the Spanish setting is nigh on perfect because in 1978, Spain and the UK had a century-old extradition treaty that ran out and it wasn't replaced until years later. So after 1978, southeastern Spain, the Costa del Sol became known as the Costa del Crime because it just became a haven for British gangsters, pimps, sex offenders, fraudsters, uh, you name it. So the setting is very good here. So I love so much about this film. It has plenty of violent set pieces in it. I think it's about 140 minutes and it's a good pace to it. You know, you go from one violent set piece to another and Fernando Reyes always one step behind until the final confrontation. You always see him looking over the carnage that's been wrought by these British gangsters who kind of fish out of wars. And Ray seems like this haunted figure, like he's got this impossible task to catch these men before they kill anyone else. It's also quite a thoughtful film, and it's a film about men struggling to come to peace with their emotions, because even though Stamp seems calm and contented, there's actually a twist to that, uh, in that he's not so uh, at peace with himself. And the same for John Hurd, even though he seems like this icy cool hitman for whom killing is just a job, in the way that being an accountant is just a job, he begins to crack. And the fact that... Um, Tim Roth starts off as a complete fog. You know, you just want to give him a smack him, you know, just to get him to shut up with all the boasting and just the cocksure attitude he's got. He gets a bit deep, the fact that he doesn't want to kill a woman and, and, and so forth. So it's a very surprising gangster film. It's an original gangster film. It stands out from other 
organized crime films in, in, in the British genre, like Bride and Rock and, and Get Carter and Long Good Friday, the, the plot is quite original. And it's a very special film if you're a big Terence Stamp fan. And I would probably include myself as a big Terence Stamp fan. I'm just going to go into how this film kind of made his career come full circle because in the early 60s, Terence Stamp was a jobbing actor who shared a flat with another jobbing actor called Michael Caine, or Morris Michael White, as, as his birth name was before he changed it to his stage name, Michael Caine. And believe it or not, they were both broke. They could barely afford the rent at times. But then Terence Stamp gets his first movie role in Billy Budd, directed by Peter Ustinov, and he plays a title character. And the film is such a hit, he actually gets an Oscar nomination for his performance in his, in his debut role. And that's not bad going. Kane's career takes off almost exactly the same time. He becomes a star after Zulu. And so they both become these really fashionable figures in, you know, swing in London. But then they begin to fall out. They had an epic falling out. There was a fair bit of rivalry involved. Basically, Stamp moved his girlfriend at the time, Jean Shrimpton, into the flat, and Kane didn't like their behaviour. They've both given their own version of the story. But eventually, Kane chucked both Terence and, and Jean Shrimpton out, and they haven't spoken since. For a while, Stamp remained the kind of 60s poster child. You know, he, he had a relationship with his co-star, Julie Christie, for, in Far From the Modern Crowd, and that's actually referenced in the Kinks song, Waterloo Sunset. He was considered for the role of James Bond. He said he thinks he frightened off Harry Saltzman, the producer. His take on the character was too dark and they weren't ready for that. And then suddenly in the early 70s, the phone stops ringing. And it's not that he's being offered bad roles instead of good roles. He's being offered no roles at all. And what he says is what he heard was the casting directors were going around saying, we're looking for the new Terrence Stamp. And he's like, I'm only in my early 30s. Well, welcome to show business. You know, one minute you're hot and the next minute you're not. So he decamps to India. He lives in a commune for years. He, he doesn't work in show business at all for years. He doesn't have much choice. And then one day when he's in India, a telegram arrives and it's addressed to Clarence Stamp. He's fallen so far from grace, I actually got his name wrong. But they were offering the role of General Zod in the new Superman film. And that launched his comeback of Superman as a huge hit. But the hit with Stephen Frears came a few years after that. And it really launched his critical comeback because you saw him play the kind of Cockney white boy you know, made good. He was still, you know, a really handsome guy. He was still kind of, you know, fashionable looking. It reminded you of his roles in the 60s and his persona from the 60s. And the film was loved by, it didn't do very well financially, but it was loved by critics and it was loved by fellow filmmakers. And Oliver Stone actually gave Terence Stamp a role in Wall Street based on his performance on this. And I just think it's, it's, it's a really, really good film. And with regards to Stephen Frears, it's actually only his second feature film. He'd made his feature film debut in a film called Gumshoe, which was a private eye spoof set in Liverpool, which is actually really good. And if you like Liverpool on film, you know, as we work there, it's, it's fascinating. And, and then he worked more and more in TV for the rest of the decade. And then it, 13 years after Gumshoe, he makes his second film, which is the hit. And I think it really showed you his versatility as a director because you've got beautiful cinematography, beautiful soundtrack, an original story, strong writing, really great performances from an ensemble cast. I mean, a comeback role for Stamp. John Hurt was fairly well established by then. It was introducing the world to Tim Roth and uh, Laura Del Sol. Early role for Jim Broadbent as one of the barristers cross-examining Stamp. And he's a director who's good with actors and, and subsequently went on to make made a couple more crime films like uh, The Grifters, adaptation of Jim Thompson, which is wonderful, but also many, many diverse dramas. So, you know, I think you can dip into almost any Stephen Frears film. You're probably going to have a good time. But right at the top of the list, I'm going to say The Hit is my highbrow recommendation. But I hope you enjoy it. That was a very erudite defence of it, Steve. Just to pick up on a few things. First of all, we were talking about Cockney accents last week. And again, I think... Like Ben Kingsley, I think Tim Roth is slightly over the top. I know it was his first feature and he was keen to impress. And as Myron, he does have threatening moments, but he's certainly not half as threatening as uh, John Hurt's character is. In the same way that Ian McShane plays a far more threatening character in Sexy Beast than 
Ben Kingsley's. I, I knew very little about the plot. I deliberately didn't read up on what it was about. So at first I thought, this is going to be a grimy London-based gangster movie. And then, of course, it moves to Spain. And then after a while, I realised, OK, this is going to be a low-budget road movie where there's a kind of shift in the balance of power taking place in the car as they travel along. And I thought, that's a plot line that's been done many times since. And the one that sprung to mind was the Roy Scheider, Adam Baldwin, doubleheader, Cohen and Tate, where it's actually a little kid plays them off against each other. But I thought it was very well done. And they made the most of the Spanish locations, like you say, some beautiful cinematography. Some lovely camera work. One scene that springs to mind is when it's Braddock and Maggie at the petrol station. He goes in to kill the attendant and she climbs out the back or the passenger side window. It's just a very high shot as he's walking towards her, you know, and then they're resting on the ground. There was obviously some kind of bond between Braddock and Maggie because the scene where he's basically letting her bite his hand until it bleeds... He obviously finds that he likes playing power games with people. And then she becomes the biggest threat of all. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I was wondering, it, sometimes it does seem like a kind of sadomasochistic sexual dynamic. And mm-hmm. at other times it seems tender. Because the scene, a bit further on at that, when he whispers to her, you're a very lucky girl, it almost seems a bit paternal. We know that Tim Roth starts to crumble the minute a, a woman gets in the car. It's interesting about Tim Roth because a few weeks ago we did the cut of FIFA's Wife and Her Lover and he had a, actually a smaller role in that. And we were talking about that film being, you know, full of upcoming talent like Alex Kingston and Kieran Hines and, and stuff. And I'm just thinking, well, cut of FIFA's Wife and Her Lover was 89. The hit was 84. I haven't seen Made in Britain, the Alan Clark film. I think he plays a skinner, doesn't he, a neo-Nazi. Mm-hmm. But I guess he didn't really become a star until Reservoir Dogs. So he had a good... 10-year apprenticeship didn't he yeah uh, yeah i suppose his accent is a little bit overdone whereas stank being a cockney born at brad he, d- he doesn't need to overdo the accent it's his natural voice he's very authoritative when he speaks the only film i thought he ever did it was the limey by steven soderbergh well i, I haven't seen it but i believe that might well feature in a future episode dear listeners it may um, well, yeah but possibly because, you know, sometimes in a foreign movie, so that people get the idea that you're from a certain country, you sometimes have to overdo the accent. Mm-hmm. It's the kind of the Hollywood version of it. So maybe he was told to ramp it up a bit so people would know that he was from South London, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But I, I look forward to seeing the line. I mean, that's yet another one on the bucket list, as was this, actually. It was one that I definitely meant to watch at some point. So this is great, Steve. I'm getting through my bucket list rightly. Thanks for that. <laughs> I don't know, not at all. I'm yeah. um, oh, just talking about Terence Stamp's accent. Shall I share the Superman story with our listeners? The one that I was talking about in work. Oh, yes, please about do. About Zod, yes. The yeah. fact that when he starts off, what, what I, lo- I mean, I love about his portrayal of Zod, and for me, he is the definitive Zod. Um, it's when, <laughs> at the start, it, when he's doing his, you know, our fate is in your hands, jor the vote, The vote must be unanimous. It's all very RSC and pronounced. Yeah. And then the angry gets the more cockney sounds, you know, he saying, you will bow down before me, Jarrell, you and you descendants. And you're just waiting for him to go, you slags, at the end. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, I, I mean, I, I'd forgotten that Superman and Superman 2 were kind of his big comeback, and what a good role to get. But, yes, just watching that again recently, I did think the, it gets more cockney, the angrier it gets. Starts yeah. off all that's RSC gravitas like he's doing, oh, I don't know, Hamlet. But then <laughs> it all just it becomes his natural cockney self. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, um, do, do you know, uh, can I share with you a couple of his Michael Caine stories? Yeah, go on. Uh, they both, I think, having kind of skim read both through their autobiographies, they start gracious saying like, oh, we were good friends and then we drifted apart, these things happen. And then they get a bit more acid as they go on. But Caine being the older one by eight years, he said that Caine was his guru. And one of the things he said that Caine said to him was like, only ever do the work if you feel like it's special and it's going to be brilliant. Don't ever accept a role for money. And he's like, and then, and then he blooming does Jaws the Revenge and yeah. the Hand and Ashanti and the Swarm and goodness knows how many others. You know? Blame it on Rio. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder why this doesn't have a big, maybe because it does drift away from its initial genre premise into rogue movie Western territory, that this wasn't as big a commercial hit and also isn't well as well known in, in the pantheon of great British gangster films. I mean, for me, it's up there in its own way with Get Carter, mm -hmm. which funnily enough actually wasn't a commercial hit. And it came out and it took about 20 years for its reputation to really ascend. But I don't know if the, if it mixes too many genres. I don't know. I mean, I, I enjoyed it, but you could obviously tell. I mean, it was funded by Central Productions, which is the same Central Television ITV franchise. So maybe there just wasn't the finance to really push it. One gets the impression that maybe it was a made-for-television movie that somehow made it into the cinema rather than something that was made for the big screen. Well, if it did, that's a happy accident because, like I said, three years have kind of got, well, I wouldn't say fallen into television because, you know, you direct a lot of really good television, a lot of television is great, but there was terrible snobbery with casting directors and whatnot about there are TV actors and there are film actors and you're not supposed to mix in that time. Uh, and subsequently he starred in, he's directed more and more films. And it's produced by the great Jeremy Thomas, who I mentioned in our last episode, who later produced The Wonderful Sexy Beast, which is quite similar or well, very similar thematically in terms of the, the gangster has retired to Spain. Whereas in Sexy Beast, they want to bring him back for one last job. Whereas in this, the hit, they're actually, they're just bringing him back to kill him. You know, it's unfinished business. I thought seeing Fernando Rey was interesting because sometimes when I'm watching these films, I think I try and play spot the actor as well and seeing Fernando Rey from The French Connection. I completely missed Jim Broadbent as um, a barrister. But it's only when you then look at the cast list and the credits and go, oh, no. <laughs> and then spin back to see it that you think, oh, yeah, that's Jim Broadbent. Um, yeah, well, he was he was quite younger. Then. I think the yeah. only the, the earliest thing I remember him being in was Only Falls and Horses, where he played the bank copper who often crosses swords with Dalboy mm -hmm. in a few episodes. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, and if I repeat myself here, just cut this bit. But Bertie Smalls, the character Willie Parker is based on. That actually happened during one of his testimonies. The the gangsters in the dock stood up and started singing We'll Meet Again in, in a very Courtney accent. So we'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when. So that that <laughs> instant in the film really happened in a, a real... Because I was watching this yeah. thinking this is some kind of surreal joke on the part <laughs> of the director, kind of trying to make fun of the old thing. But yeah. yeah, you can imagine it actually, just them being not caring about being so threatening in court. <laughs> yeah. Is it true, by the way, that it was... Let me tell the story, and then you can tell me if it's true or not. That, okay. And I don't know where it came from, that when Michael Caine and Terence Stamp were living together, quite a few of their male friends accused them of being a gay couple. So Terence Stamp disappeared for a couple of months and then came back, and Michael said to him, where have you been? And Terence said, you know all those guys who accused us of being a gay couple? I've just slept with all their wives. Well, it's in Michael Caine's autobiography, so ah, he okay. thinks it's true. I don't know. I've never heard Stamp comment on this. Goodness knows he had some beautiful girlfriends in the 60s, like Gene Shrimpton, and Julie Christie, I've mentioned. The one thing I did see, hear him say is that they shared a room. They had single beds in the same room. Right. So if one of them brought, you know, a dolly bird back, then the other one would uh, throw out their bedding to say, don't come in, you know, I've got a, a lady in, in the room with me. But Stamp made out that it was Kane who was the bit more sexually voracious of the two. Okay. Um, I mean, I think Stamp's a better looking guy, but that's often the way if, if yeah, I guess Kane felt like, you know, he, well, he, he brought in the spectacles, you know, he made, he made uh, glasses a bit more fashionable with Harry Palmer, didn't he? You know, they, they were both icons mm -hmm. in their way. It seems plausible. It seems perfectly plausible. It's quite promiscuous in the 60s. They don't call them the swing in 60s for nothing, do they? Right, that's very true. If you remember them, then you weren't there, as they say. <laughs> yeah. So, right, I just thought I'd ask that. Uh, so from the 80s to the, um, the noughties, my pick this week is Stephen Freer's 2000 adaptation of Nick Hornby's 1995 book, High Fidelity. Now, I read the book at the time when it came out and it struck a chord with me because I'm very much the kind of person who likes his music in alphabetical order. 
in a certain kind of no I, I do draw the line at spending an evening like the main character rob does uh rearranging from alphabetical to chronological to autobiographical i don't have that much time in my hands or that inclination but certainly one of the things in the book and it's carried to the film is how they like to make like the top five of things for example the top five songs for a monday morning i'm one of these people who loves doing lists like that i've got a but called music listography, and this it's almost like it was written for me, really. So, Steve, if you want to think of a list while I'm doing this, do let me know. And if I can't answer it at the time, I'll put it in the Twitter comments. But the film starts with uh, Rob Gordon, his girlfriend Laura leaving him, and he's kind of having an argument with her while he's listening to music. And then it goes into his top five breakups, uh, where he goes through his top the worst breakups, of which Laura isn't in the top five first of all but then by the time he gets to number five he decides that she is he also owns a record shop championship vinyl which is at the time hipster wasn't a term but it's a very kind of hipster store it's almost like they don't that's run in a way that like they don't want you to buy records it reminds me of tales i used to hear about whenever pete burns of dead or alive used to work at pro records how people would come in and they'd want to buy things and he'd criticize some musical tastes and sometimes they'd buy it anyway and sometimes they'd leave in a huff so it's the kind of the record store where they often wonder to the you know why they're not getting any business but at the same time he's not putting himself out there advertising it it's in the wrong part of town it's looking really run down. He's got two employees who either can't sell a record to save their lives or just don't like people in general. While he's doing that, he's also going through his past breakups and trying to find the reason for why they failed. So he then starts contacting his exes. And this is when the kind of backstory comes in. In the same way, Laura is quite friendly with his sister, who's played by John Cusack's real sister, Joan Cusack. And then some kind of unpleasant backstory comes out against about Rob. So it's re- therefore revealed to you that he's not maybe the wholesome human being he would have you believe he is. And as the film goes on, then the he watches other people, like one of his employees, the very shy one, get himself a girlfriend. And he has one night stands with some other women, but then realizes that Laura really is the woman for him. He also exposes himself as a bit of a hypocrite because he fantasizes about her having sex with their next door neighbor, Ian, played by a ponytail to Tim Robbins. And yet at the same time, he's spending the night with Marie de Salle, played by Lisa Bonnet. So Laura and Rob are still having sporadic contact throughout the film and the, you see she's coming to get her stuff and then they have from his flat and then they're having arguments so they are all, they're always keeping in some kind of contact while this is going on and then Laura, Laura's father dies and that brings them back together and she sets up some kind of launch for some record that two skateboarding shoplifters have recorded apparently he used to be a DJ and he starts DJing again And then he realizes that Laura is the one that he wants because he says about leaping from rock to rock. And then he realizes that he has to stop doing that sometimes. So in a way, it's a novel about growing up as well. So he then realizes that Laura is the one for him and they all lived happily ever after. Now, (laughs) there's a lot of breaking the fourth wall in this. In fact, Nick Hornby even said about the adaptation that it's almost like John Cusack's reading the book on film. A lot of his uh, monologues are taken directly from the text in the book. In, a, in fact, um, John Cusack was quite reluctant to do that method until Stephen Frears joined the, and Stephen suggested it. And then John said, well, OK, they agreed to do it. There's a bit too much of it. The film runs for almost two hours and watching it again, I thought it does. This doesn't need to be two hours long. The book itself is about 250 pages and it motors along rightly. You could quite easily cut back on a lot of the monologues. And there's characters in the book that don't even make it into the film. But what I do enjoy about it is the kind of, I think a lot of men my age, if they like to ask them to look in the mirror, they would be very like Rob in the way that they're kind of slightly snobbish about their musical tastes. Certainly I was, when this book came out in 95, I was very into my kind of bleepy electronic music. And then later on, I realized that, they're, you know, having a, a song with a tune in it that you can hum along is actually not a bad thing. I'll be honest and say I was slightly up myself at the time I read the book. The interesting thing about the film, though, is that it came out in 2000, just as the internet was taking off and shops like Championship Vinyl were beginning to close. I mean, later in that decade, there'd be a book and then a documentary called Last Shop Standing about the gradual decline of the independent record shop. Now, of course, with vinyl making a comeback, 
in a slightly more niche way in that it's better quality but more expensive the record the independent record shop is kind of on the way back but certainly the way championship vinyl is run it's no surprise that it's struggling because they don't really have a commercial head on and you almost feel like if you went in and asked was that record available on cd you'd get lynched although they have tips and uh, kind of stuck in a rack somewhere it is primarily vinyl and you think if you asked for any other format they just um they wouldn't be very pleased at all one other criticism i have this film i'm sorry jack black fans but i'm not a jack black fan for me he just seems to play the same character in each film the best thing he did was get shot to pieces by Bruce Willis in the Jackal, if I'm honest. Yeah, you've stolen yeah. my my line. I was I was going to say that 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 was the only good thing Jack Black has done is is being yeah blown up by Bruce Willis in the Jackal. <laughs> well, oh, I'm glad we agree on that. So, yeah. um, and the other thing this thing this is a trick on is although there's a Bruce Springsteen um, cameo in it, and I think there's some some other musician who I didn't recognise. It, I don't know whether it was a licensing thing or a budget thing, but when you look at the list of songs in the soundtrack, you only basically get a snippet of them. I mean, the budget was 30 million, so I suspect it may have been they couldn't afford to buy more than a snippet. But in fact, they mentioned the Belfast band from the 70s and 80s, Stiff Little Fingers, which I'm sure a lot of the US audience have never heard of. And yet they get a brief spin in the film and they don't even appear on the soundtrack. So it's a shame, really, for a film about music. There's not a lot of music in it or the snippets of it and the other thing as well you'll notice is it's very stagey a lot of it is shot in the studio there's a few exteriors in and around chicago but a lot of it is very studio bound and indeed it was a musical for a while and there was a one season where it was made as a tv series which got cancelled it was on hulu which i haven't seen and reading it i just i'm not inclined to dig it out I mean, one funny bit, for example, is when the snobbish Jack Black is criticising somebody else's music taste and then he sticks on Walking on Sunshine by Katrina and the Waves, which is just a night night pop song. So it has moments like that where it's quite good. But yes, uh, it's kind of a, a low point in the film for me. If I can just give uh, one actual serious Jack Black recommendation, Bernie, directed by Richard Linklater, and it's actually a true crime film where he plays uh, a mortician it's set in a very kind of upper middle class Texas town, uh, Carthage, and he befriends an elderly widow played by Shelley McKellie and ends up uh, murdering her. It's very film noir, but also kind of black comedy. And he's playing a very kind of mannered guy, an unusual guy, a guy who would stand out, even though he's usually decked out in a kind of black suit, you know, because he's a mortician. He does a bit of am dram and, and everything but a, a very eccentric type of guy. But he, he actually reigns in his performance because he's playing someone so eccentric. He doesn't really need to go up to the top. This is a slightly colourful, fruity guy. And uh, it's it's just a good true crime drama. And I'm going to go with that for Jack Black's best film. That's just a little tangent for our viewers. There you go, folks. Something you never knew existed, a half-decent Jack Black movie. There you are. <laughs> So one of the things, just to point out, in the book, it's set in London, in North London, and in the film, obviously, it's shifted to Chicago. Certainly reading the book and watching the film again, and at the time and still today, I could cast, I would know some people like characters in the book, more so at the time when there were quite a few independent record shops about in Belfast. So you could say, even if I was watching it uh, five years ago, it would have dated. But in fact, with record shops coming back, it is current. But it is very much as well about Rob growing up. But certainly bits in the film like top five breakup songs or top five songs from Monday morning. I was thinking, what would be my top five songs from Monday morning? So it might bring back a few memories. But certainly my music is alphabetical. But there's no way I'm going to put it into chronological or autobiographical order. Good grief. So, Steve, I think this will be interesting because, given our age difference, vinyl won't have been such a big thing for you growing up. So I'm interested as to what you made of this. I, I, I do know vinyl from a nostalgic point of view. See, I'm the baby of the family, and my sister and brother are 18 years and 15 years older than me, respectively. So I listened to a lot of my sister's vinyl from Kate Bush to Boney M, uh, you know, everything in between. But I mean, I thought your description of the film there was brilliant. In fact, I almost wish that I hadn't watched the film beforehand and listened to your description because you discussed the arc of John Cusack's character. Whereas when I sat down to watch it, 
I'm watching, I'm thinking, well, it's it's fairly engaging, it's quite amusing in places. But I just really started to struggle and with John Cusack. Not the actor John Cusack, actually, you know, the character. I started to think, I really don't like you at, at times. I think the thing about calling up his exes, that just bothered me. Phoning up women who are now married with children, that bothered me. I know, I know it's just a plot device and it's a rock con. I shouldn't take it too seriously. But uh, I just felt like until the end, he didn't grow. You know, there was stuff about him borrowing four grand off a girlfriend he never paid back. There was the stuff about the abortion, which I thought was tactless. There was stuff in it that I didn't like, but there was a, there was also stuff I was more sympathetic to. You know, I've acted a bit in the theatre, so I tend to like films with a staginess or a theatrical device. I didn't mind the monologues, and I'm surprised to hear that Cusack did because, you know, I knew actors who would absolutely kill to get monologues like that. It's very rare where you get to do so much talking directly to the audience. But because this is the first time you revisit the film in, in what, 20 years or so, uh, uh, or since it came out 22 years ago, didn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, That's right. You, you say it, it changed a lot in your mind. I, I suspect, I didn't think the film was mature enough, and I started to think about other Nick Hornby adaptations. I really love About a Boy, which is probably one of my favourites. I haven't seen the American Fever Pitch, but I saw the British Fever Pitch, and I didn't buy it. I didn't buy um, Mark Strong and Colin Firth as two beer-guzzling Arsenal fans. Did you not? <laughs> no. I would have, I would have thought it um, would be difficult to buy anybody as an Arsenal fan. Oh, sorry, Arsenal. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Arsenal listeners. <clears throat> sorry. Yeah. Lucky Arsenal, which I know uh, is a phrase they hear. Uh, I, I enjoy it. But then, you see, I'm not a huge football fan, so I enjoyed that film more than I did the book, because at least the book, the book's very autobiographical, whereas the film has to bring a plot into it. But, yeah, um, I don't know. Um, so I'm lost for words now. What were you saying? <laughs> Have you seen About a Boy? I haven't seen About a Boy. I would recommend that one, definitely. It's Hugh Grant on top form. Okay. And uh, I, I know... I'm not sure if you're a Hugh Grant fan or not. I know he went through that terrible stage of making one rom-com after another. But this this was a good rom-com and great ensemble cast like Tony Collette and Rachel Weisz and a uh, very young Nicholas Holt. Very young. You know, it's just a wee bear in it, really. There was one with Ethan Hawke as a, as a rock star who's been a recluse for years and then he finally comes out of the Juliet Naked. That's it. Oh, that is Nick Hornby. Yeah, and I thought, I haven't read any of these Nick Hornby books, I should come out and say, but Juliet Naked, I thought, was a good film. And again, that was a lot about the joy of music and how we take these songs and they become our own because they become our breakups or our maturation or, or whatnot. Um, shall I give you a list, Dan? <laughs> uh, what, do you want me to think of top five something or other? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's, go let's, on then. Let's, let's test your Nick Hornby uh, Top five what? Well, how about top five songs that remind you of Belfast? They don't have to be Belfast songs, but a top Ooh, five songs. Oh, that good make one. you homesick. <laughs> i tell you what we'll do, listener. We'll keep going with this, and then I'll either put it in the Twitter comments or I'll record it at the end of the podcast. Okay. Juliet Naked, that's one I must check out then if it's in the same idea as High Fidelity. That sounds like that's something I would enjoy. So thank you for that. I will check that out. Oh, Chris O'Dowd as well at Rose Byrne, I see, looking at the um, Wikipedia page. So did you think it was too long? Yeah, I did. I, I did think it was too long. Yeah. So, I mean, it's longer than the hit, I, mm. uh, which considering, I suppose the hit is many genres. It's part thriller. So you want a thriller to snap by. But I didn't like, uh, some of the relationships were obviously very throwaway. I mean, Catherine Zeta-Jones isn't in it much because mm. you know you know she's not the one. The minute you see her, you think, oh, she's too flighty. I did like, and in fact, I looked her up, the Danish actress, Iben Hilch, right. who played Laura, and uh, I thought she was wonderful. But I, w- I just had this feeling that maybe she could have done better. <laughs> maybe she could have done better than him. Than Rob and I, I like Lisa Burnett. You know, he was very beautiful and enigmatic in this. Hmm. Yeah, I, I started to think actually a lot of the women could do better than him. I, I struggled with him, and I think you're right. In fact, you know, my better half pointed this out to me when we're watching it together, is that some of the transitions from London to Chicago, even names like Ian Raymond, which sounds kind of English, and in the first minute his opening monologue, he mentions Desert Island Discs. He doesn't specifically mention the radio show, but I, I'm, I'm assuming in the book he's talking about the radio show and, and in the screenplay they're probably thinking, oh, American audience will just think he's talking about a real Desert Island or something. Because mm-hmm. I don't think Desert Island Discs is a big show in America. 
I think if you were listening to the World Service, obviously, or you you would hear it. But no, I don't think I don't think maybe PBS is a version of it. Let me check. I think a lot of viewers and listeners might be familiar with the concept of it rather than the actual show itself. No, I don't see any mention of any other versions of it. But that is the kind of a criticism that maybe should have been rewritten in the US-based screenplay. There is that. You're absolutely right. Or maybe they just assumed people would work out what it was or at least get something out of the reference. Well, I mean, I don't want to be too down on this film. I mean, maybe if I saw it when it first came out, I would have liked it more. But, in the, you know, in the spirit of listing, I just felt it was near the bottom of my Stephen Frears. And I just felt Stephen Frears can direct better than this. Well, you've given me a list, which I'm yeah. still thinking about. Top five Stephen Frears, please. OK, I'll start with number one, because if, if I work my way down, I'll get it wrong. OK, well, number one is probably predictable. I'll go with a hit. I love the film and I think it's a beautifully produced film. And then my prejudice towards genre, I would probably say number two would be The Grifters, which is a fabulous film and had a great performance from John Cusack in that alongside Annette Benning and Angelica Houston, an adaptation of the Jim Thompson. Dangerous Liaisons I didn't see till this year, which is surprising because it's such a classic. And I thought it was fantastic. John Malkovich. That's the very manipulative, sexy French aristocrat who's just all, you know, sleaze and manipulation, Glenn Close, Michelle Pfeiffer, Uma Thurman, wonderful cast. And then number four, I'll go for Gumshoe because I work in Liverpool. I lived there for many years and I love Liverpool on film. Not my favourite because it's a spoof and I'm not a huge spoof fan, but it is, you know, Private Eye and it's Albert Finney and it was his, his first film. And then number five, if I can cheat a little... I'm going to go for a TV film, and that would be The Deal, which was a very hot topic when it was first broadcast on television. It was uh, about the stitch-up in an Islington restaurant between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, when Tony Blair allegedly said to Gordon Brown, I'll step down after my first term so you could be prime minister the second term, and we know that didn't happen. Tony Blair was prime minister for 10 years, and Gordon Brown only really got the tail end of New Labour's um, tenure in office. And it's a very good film with that great impressionist, impersonator, portraitist, uh, Michael Sheen as Blair. A number of times he played him, also played him in Stephen Frears' The Queen, and David Morrissey as Brown. And that's the only time I saw Stephen Frears interviewed, actually, because he went on, I can't remember if it was The Daily Politics or This Week, but one of those great politics shows that was fronted by Andrew Neil, and he was totally monosyllabic. Andrew Neil was trying to interview him. And and I think Andrew Neil is one of the really incisive interviewers, you know, and a lot of people refuse to go up against him because, you know, he can put the fear of God in even to the toughest politician, but just free as acted like he wasn't even in the room. And that made me think, hmm, maybe it's that old thing of I don't meet your heroes, they might. uh, I don't know if he had previous with Andrew Neil, I've no idea, but I was just like, if I ever meet Stephen Frears, I'll probably be completely tongue-tied, and he probably won't answer my questions, so maybe it's a good job if I don't meet him. But there you go, that's my slightly long-winded answer, uh, Dan, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think you, I think I deserve an equally long-winded answer uh, from you now about your top five lists of songs that remind you of growing up in Belfast. But I think, dear boy, we will have to just, I'll have to splice it in later. I'm still working on it, to be honest. Okay, <laughs> don't, right. don't worry, dear listener. By the time you come to listen to this, I will have uh, decided and recorded, or like I say, put in the Twitter notes or something, so we won't leave you hanging. Don't okay. Worry. Well, Dan, did you ever visit Empire Records? Empire Records. Um, Wait, is it called Empire Records? Yeah, do you mean, they made do a mean, film about it. I've seen the film Empire Records, and you never know, dear listener, that might come up on a different, uh, another episode. I used to go to Tar Records a lot when I was living in London in Piccadilly Circus. It was like my mecca, basically. I've got the wrong film. Sorry. There was a film about this kind of Belfast dream. It's a true story around this record. Oh, Good Vibrations. Yes, that's it. Oh, yes, yes. I went to Good Vibrations a lot. It's one of these shops that kind of opens and closes and opens and closes, so I believe at the moment it's closed, but it may well reopen. Again, you see, whenever the book came out there was good vibrations heroes and villains was another secondhand one in belfast there was dr roberts 
Hector's house. They were all over the place. And of course, all these places are closed now. Oh, the gramophone shop, uh, making tracks, golden discs. You know, I could just run off a list of independent names. I was in Good Vibrations certainly a couple of times. It wasn't speaking to the legendary Terry Healy, but he was there and I recognised him. Uh, that's certainly one shop I would like to see come back if it hasn't already. I must check. Actually, while, while we're here, just let me have a quick look. Good Vibrations. Let's see what's happening. There. there is a shop in San Francisco called Good Vibrations, but it's not a record shop. It's um... Oh, <laughs> Uh, need I go on? Heading. Yeah, right. Okay, better, better not. <laughs> okay, so um, let me just put in good vibrations. Oh, well, it says was on the Wikipedia entry. Oh, um, no, closed the shop for the final time due to ill health. He closed it for the final time on June 2015. So nice. there we are. But, you know, it lasted a good while. And yes. if you haven't seen the film Good Vibrations, you really should. It's very good. I should ask you, as co-host on this Stephen Freer special, what your top five Stephen Freers are. I don't know if I've seen enough to do a top five. I'll have a look. Let me have a look at his filmography. And I suppose, therefore, I should ask you your top five uh, songs that remind you of home or growing up. Well, dear, dear listener, I grew up in Chester, so there's not many songs written about Chester. I mean, at least Boney M rang, sang a song about Belfast which my sister had on vinyl. <laughs> I got into music quite late, actually. Although listening to my sister's vinyl a bit, I, I would just scrounge CDs off um, friends at school. I didn't buy a lot of CDs at first. And I remember scrounging the Snoop Dogg album because I liked that song where he did that thing everybody was doing with their tongue where he did... Right. <laughs> I cannot even remember what it was called. I can't even remember many lyrics. But okay. then when I listened to the albums, I was shocked because usually the singles would be the kind of palatable ones with no bad language or it would be beeped out on MTV. The albums, the misogyny and the homophobia and the kind of songs that were hidden away, I, I was kind of really, really shocked. I'm not really a man of my time. I'm a, I'm a man of the past. <laughs> the past is just very, very romantic to me. Okay. So growing up in the 90s, I was thinking about the 60s. So I was thinking a lot about the Beatles and the Kinks. What is Loose Sunset? The aforementioned What Loose Sunset, I think, is wonderful. The Stones. And I mean, it's barely a song. It's more of a instrumental, something like Connie Hemi knocking. And these songs have nothing to do with Chester, really, although the Stones did play Chester twice, I, sh I should say. And there was a woman at my mum's United Reformed Church who went to see them uh, in concert in Chester, and apparently it was pretty wild. This was like an 18, 19-year-old woman who was giving me her memories of seeing the Stones before they were famous. <laughs> we borrow culture, shall we say, in Chester, if you, if you, if you haven't got any imports on Right. OK. I haven't seen five Stephen Frears. So the ones I have seen are the two out of the three ones he did for the comic strip presents. So one I can't repeat. Or we'll <laughs> but it, it, it's, it has bonehead and foil in it. Let me put it that way. And Mr. Jolly lives next door. And of course, I've seen High Fidelity and The Hit and The Grifters. I would recommend The Grifters. That's another one of his I have seen. And then there's a lot that I know, which I just haven't seen. That would be my top five because it's the only five I've seen of his, really. Oh, I saw Quiz, the Charles Ingram, who wants to be a millionaire scandal. Oh, right. Yes, yeah, so I was thinking of Quiz Show, the Robert Redford no, one. Oh, right. miniseries, which was on TV. So I've seen that, and that's right. I mean, it tells the story pretty well if you don't know it. And if you do know it, it's still a very good retelling of just how ridiculous it all got. Can't so. Michael Sheen play anyone? They should cast him as Chairman Mao or something. <laughs> you know, he's oh, Chris yeah. Tarrant in there, isn't he? And... Yeah, he's... Um, <laughs> He's played David Frost as well. He's Brian Clough. Brian Clough, yeah. He's Tony Blair. Tony Blair, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, Chris Tarrant. Yeah, there he is. Let's see what else he's done. Yeah, he's played Tony Blair more than once, hasn't he? Oh, I should point out, he's also played Jesus Christ. He did a passion play in his native Swansea. Oh, okay, good on him. He was in Tron Legacy as well. I've forgotten the name of the character in that, but I thought he was very good. He's done Under Milk Wood, but I suppose that's almost a rite of passage if you're a Welsh actor, a bit of Dylan Thomas. And then he was in the Underworld franchise as well. Yeah, he's a talented man, is Mr Sheen. He certainly so. is, yeah. Well, thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed this special Stephen Frears edition. 
Stephen Frey is the British director, has had a long, long career, many, many diverse films, and we've recommended two for you. And we do hope that you will watch the two Stephen Frey's films we recommended, The Hit and High Fidelity, and let us know your thoughts on both. Have we overpraised them or underrated them, or did we get them bang on? Anyway, thanks for listening again, and we will see you next time. And just before we leave you, dear listener, just time for me to give you my top five songs that remind me of Belfast. And you can have whatever version of the Top of the Pops theme you like running under this. At number five, I know they're a dairy band, but they were on the Good Vibrations label. It's The Undertones and My Perfect Cousin. I mean, where else than Northern Ireland did you get a band that has his mother bought him a synthesizer, got the Human League into advisor as a rhyming couplet? Fabulous stuff. At number four, it's Neon Neon and Belfast from their album Stainless Style. The whole album's about the John DeLorean saga, but Belfast is about him leaving Belfast for the last time. At number three, it's Enya from the album Watermark and On Your Shore, because it kind of reminds me of um, just coming home. At number two, Michael Oakley, Crystal Ships from his album Introspect. And this is more to do with uh, an absent friend of mine and the time I spent with her while I was in Belfast. And at number one, it's the Electric Light Orchestra and Hello My Old Friend. This was meant to be released in 1983 on their album Secret Messages. It eventually turned up in 1990 and it's about Jeff Lynne's hometown of Birmingham, but I can relate to it quite a bit when visiting Belfast. Jeff Lynne's a bit of a Beatles fan and you can hear the references throughout the song. So I hope you enjoy my little list. I'll post videos to it on Twitter and Facebook and there'll be an extended Spotify playlist with additional titles. So happy listening. You've been listening to Highbrow Lowbrow, presented by Steve Pyle and Dan Slattery. We'd love to hear from you and you can contact us by going to our link tree. That's linktr.ee forward slash highbrow lowbrow. Until next time, keep it highbrow and lowbrow.